Welcome back, DJ Mushu. Thank you for being here. Awesome. Yeah, I uh, had to lay low for a while. I'm everything's sorry. Okay. everything's okay. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, everything's fine. You know what's her name? Uh, your ex and her, her sister Sugar Cuts came to my office looking for you. What 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 did they what did they want? They, <laughs> well, first of all, they said they need to talk to you, and they, they, you owe them, you owe them money. I. <laughs> you serious? Okay, first of all, Sugar Cuts. You should not trust a word coming out of her mouth. Like, she Why? used to work at Arby's. She lies for a living. Uh -huh. like, I, second okay. of all, okay, she's the one that owes me money. And also, I took the test. It's not mine. Oh, hold on, like, hold on. It's, it's not mine. So, sugar cuts, so, so it's her sister says you owe her money, the ex. They said the kid's yours. You're saying it's not yours? It's not mine, and they owe me money. So, what are you going to do? I, I'm... I just got a little, I'm just gonna do databases. All right. I don't know. That's, I, I, I hope the best for you, okay. All right, um, for you guys in the class. All right, uh, so we cut off the, the lecture a little early on MVCC. Um, there's nothing really deep in there that we, I wanna discuss, so uh, we, we can learn that, and it's not something that will be covered on the, on the exam. So to get, get us back on track on schedule, I wanna focus, jump into what today's lecture will be about, which is database logging. Um, for you guys going, going forward, uh, what's due coming up is project, our homework three is due uh, November 13th, the Sunday. Uh, project three was, again, been extended by three days. It'll be due on the 16th. And then the, the, the live lecture will be on the, the 8th. The Snowflake lecture will be on the 6th, on the Tuesday. We'll also have the final exam review on the 8th as well. Okay? So any questions about homework three or project three at this point? Some of you have completed uh, Project 3. That's awesome, with 100%, so congrats. Um, a bunch of optional things that are coming up. There's a lot of database talks we have scheduled uh, at CMU. Actually, so today at 3 o'clock, there'll be somebody from uh, CMU alum coming to talk about SGDB. Uh, it's basically trying to replace the relational model, but it still uses Postgres, uh, which I don't think is a good idea, but we'll see how that goes. But, and then next Monday, we'll have uh, somebody from a system project called Gaia, or a system called Gaia, there's a database built for autonomous uh, robots. Uh, so, so what they're going to do there. The guy that's actually building this is, is like super, uh, like an elite database guy. Like he was the, like the, one of the lead architects of Amazon Aurora. He works at Redshift on Amazon. He's so good that Amazon let, is letting him do another database startup while still paying him his salary because they don't want to lose him. So he's going to talk about what, what he's building at Gaia. Tiger Beetle is a... Uh, Special purpose transactional database system that's actually written in Zig. Who here has heard of Zig? Nobody. Who here has heard of Rust? Almost everyone. So Zig is an alternative to Rust. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, like sort of that, again the the the, the memory safe. Uh, it's a memory safe programming language. Tiger Beetle is written in Zig. So we'll talk about that. And then the VMware guys give a talk at the end of this month about Splinter DB. So again, I, I've said multiple times throughout the semester how much I love databases. Like. Here's four different databases targeting different workloads and different architectures running on different platforms. Uh, and there's, you know, none of them, none of them are, well, one's running a Postgres, but like, they're, like, people are building new systems all the time now. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting things going on databases, and this is why I find this field so fascinating. Okay, again, this is optional. The first one, will, I'm not the host of the first one, it's a PL thing, uh, but the other, the other three will be, again, on, on YouTube and Zoom. All right, so today's class is we're going to talk about uh, how to make sure that our database is, is, is durable, is safe, right? So the last four lectures have been about these transactions, and, we, and then we focused on concurrency of protocols, and that was about isolation, how to prevent uh, conflicts or anomalies. Now we're here to talk about how we actually make sure that if we commit a transaction, we write a bunch of changes to the database, we commit a transaction, the database system tells us that our, our transaction is committed. How do we make sure that if there's a crash or something happens, we come back? and our data is still there, right? So let's go through a simple example. We have T1, uh, it's running by itself. For this purpose, you know, we can ignore two-phase locking, we can ignore any of the commercial stuff, um, and it's gonna read A and write on A. So assume that our buffer pool is entirely empty. So when a transaction starts, uh, it wants to read A, we gotta go up to, to disk, fetch the page that has A, and then we bring it in. Then we do a write today, a write on A, and again, we talked about how this is just writing into the page that's sitting in memory in the buffer pool, right? We apply a change there and then we're done. Now a transaction goes to commit. So let's say the worst person in the world comes along and says, I'm gonna zap the power 
on, on, on the, the data center, on the machine, right? And what happens? We lose memory. Or sorry, we, we, we lose the contents of memory. We lose our buffer pool. So that's, in this case here, if we told the outside world, sorry, that our transaction has committed uh, before it's actually written to disk, when we, come, we crash and come back after, assuming it's not bombed, uh, like, <laughs> that's, I shouldn't joke, sorry. Um, when we come back, like our change is not there, even, to, even though we told the outside world that our database has committed, right? And, and again, when we say a transaction commits, it has to file, provide the asset guarantees. And the D in asset is durability. So our change did not persist after a restart, after a crash. So this is bad. So this is the focus today for crash recovery. Um, so the recovery algorithm is going to be the techniques that the, the database system is going to implement at runtime and upon startup to ensure that all the transactions that are you know, assuming are running with all the full protections, this is how we're going to guarantee the consistency, atomicity, and durability despite any possible failure. It's not entirely true. We're talking about scenarios like if you actually bomb the data center, we can't, we can't you know, uh, how do you say this? We can't bend the laws of, 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 of physics and, and like get your data back, uh, but we'll, we'll see how to handle that. But basically, it's how this, what the protocol, the implementation, the techniques the system is going to provide for us to maybe provide these guarantees. And there's going to be two parts to this. There's the things that the data center is going to do while it's pro processing transactions normally, like during normal operations. It's the extra work it's going to do, and extra metadata and, and information it's going to store on disk. Uh, in preparation for a unclean restart or, or a crash. Then the second part is, if there is a crash upon startup, how do we look at all the things that we were, we were storing during the normal operations? How do we use that to recreate the database and put it back to uh, the correct state to make sure that we don't lose anything? Right? So today's lecture is about the first part. How, what are the things we do at runtime while we're running queries, doing updates, inserts, updates, and deletes of the database? How do we, what are we going to actually do to make sure that for the second part, when we come crash, come back, which we'll talk about Tuesday next week, how do we how do we put us back to the correct state? Okay. So there's a lot to cover here. Um, we'll, hopefully, we'll, we'll get through everything. Um, the first we need to describe is what are the different types of failures we could have, and understand what's actually possible for the data system to recover from. Then we'll talk about how we want to manage memory in our buffer pool in response to having transactions potentially write dirty data out the disk. Uh, then we'll talk about two techniques to to support. Uh, durable database systems, shadow paging, which we've covered a little bit, and write ahead logging, which I've alluded to, I think, throughout the semester. Then we'll talk about actually what we're going to put inside the log records if we're doing write ahead logging. Uh, and then we'll talk about doing checkpoints to cut off, the, to reduce the, uh, the recovery time if you're using a write ahead log. But then we'll see on Tuesday next week how to improve this. So the spoiler is going to be for this lecture that write ahead log is going to be the ideal approach that we're going to want to use and most systems are going to use. And most database systems are going to use this, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll understand why as we go along, OK? All right, so the first thing we got to understand is what are the type of failures that can occur and what is actually possible to recover from. So recall that throughout the entire semester, we've been talking about these disk-oriented databases where we assume the primary storage location of the database is on disk, uh, and that we have this notion of a buffer pool that's, that's, that's volatile storage, volatile memory, and that we're using that as the stage, stage, uh, stage stage data into memory to do writes and so forth. And so now the question is, OK, what are the different scenarios that could, have, that could occur that we could end up potentially losing data or having, having a crash in our system? And what, what can be handled? All right, so, sorry, this is, so this is just sort of repeating what, what I've already said. So there's a non-volatile storage. Sorry, the volatile storage, that's a DRAM. That doesn't persist after a, a power loss of the crash. Non-volatile storage is things are retained after a loss and a crash. And then we'll have this notion of stable storage. This, this was, I think this is, this is they, just, they talk about this in the, um, in the textbook. But it basically says that like, no matter what happens, if you write think something to this, to this non-volatile storage, that you'll never lose data. And this obviously does, can't, can't possibly exist, right? If I have a hard drive, and even though maybe I F sync to it, and, and I mean, the, the bits are actually on the platter, if I light it on fire and it melts, like, it, you know, it's not gonna, I'm not going to be able to get that or do not get my data out. So the basic way we're going to be able to achieve this will be through, through replication, either at the, at the hard drive level or through multiple machines. But for our purposes, we really only need to focus on, on the top two. All right, so there's going to be three types of failures. Uh, so the transaction failures, 
system fares, and then storage, storage media fares. And we'll see the first two we can handle. The third one we'll get around uh, using replication. Um, again, the third one you would avoid if you had stable storage, which doesn't, that doesn't exist in the real world. All right, so transaction fares. These are the things we've already talked about before. So these are, the, these are reasons why the transaction may say, I can't run, and I have to roll back my changes. Um, there's logical failures or logical errors. Uh, these are things like uh, I try to insert something that is a, uh, into a column that's, that with a non-unique value, that, and there's a unique constraint on it. The database system will prevent me from doing that, and I have to roll back and abort my transaction and roll back my changes. External state failures would be if the if I, like under two-phase locking, if I try to acquire a lock on an object and there's a deadlock, the data system could decide to, to kill me, right? And I, so I need to be able to handle that and roll back any changes. The, and the, thing, the reason why I'm going through all these things is because we'll see that the, for these transactions that may have to get aboard because of these reasons, you, they may have written things to disk. And we need to get, get those, to make sure that when we come back after a crash, those changes aren't still around because we aborted our transaction before the crash. There's two types of system failures you have to deal with. Uh, the first one is the software itself is buggy and crashes. Like, an obvious thing is that the database system has a divide by zero exception that isn't caught. The whole thing crashes. The OS could potentially have a kernel panic. Right, this is a software uh, level thing where the system has to you know, simply halt and abort. So any of the state that we are maintaining about either what's in the buffer pool or program counters or registers, all that's gone. Hardware fair would be that the we lose power to the database to the machine running the database system. Uh, all memory gets wiped out, and we have to re reboot it. Um, we're going to make this assumption going forward that we'll have what is called a fail stop hardware, meaning if the the system crashes, the the data that's actually the data we've already written to to non volatile storage is not corrupted. Right now, again, in in the real world, this doesn't happen. Right, you can totally have your your the. You know the, the disk head writing to to the spinning disk hard drive, and then you pull the power, and all of a sudden, like it just careens onto the platter, and, and he starts losing data, right? Like the, you you can have you know even SSDs, you can have the cells go bad sometimes, and you lose data. So for our purposes, meaning for within the database system, we're assuming that this is not going to happen. Now we can use checksums to make sure that we can detect this, but we obviously, if the data gets corrupted, we can't reverse it unless we have a unless we have another copy, which we'll get through through replication. If you're doing, you know, assuming it's a stable storage. So the last one is essentially what I just said, and this is something that the database cannot handle. Uh, and this is where we have a cataclysmic hardware failure. That, again, the database system is software. We can't, you know, doesn't. It's not a robot. It can't pull out arms, start fixing the hard drive itself. Right? This, this is a physical issue. There's an issue with the physical hardware that the system is running on, and database systems simply cannot, 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 uh, you know, cannot fix this. Right? And this is going to require a human, to, come, a human to, to intervene on behalf of the database system and either move the instance to another machine or you know, swap out, swap out the, the buggy hardware. Right? This is not something that, that we can do. So we, we can handle the first two, but we can't ha handle this last one here. And we'll talk about distributed databases and how, how to do, handle replication to, to avoid this problem next week. Yes? So his statement is, why can't we detect there's, like, use RAID and have hardware to detect there's a failure and just recover that? Yeah, so that would be, that would still be hidden from the database system, right? The database system is not going to have, like, it's, as far as I know, it's not going to communicate with some kind of RAID controller and start making decisions on how to move things around. There's an abstraction layer from, from that part of the hardware to the database system itself. So we're not going to write custom code in the database system and say, oh, one of the disks is dying, let me go switch to another one. Right, because of all the so if the RAID controller runs out of disks that can swap out, then and starts losing data, then we're we're hosed. We can't do anything. All right. So again, if you light the machine on fire and, and, and the hard drives melt, we can't handle that. The human has to come and, and save us. That's okay. All right. So as I said before, again, the primary storage location of the database is on disk, because this is slower than than volatile memory. So we're going to always bring things into memory to, to, to stage our writes and reads, right? But now when, when, we, when a transaction commits, we need to make sure that any changes that it made are written back out to disk. It doesn't necessarily have to be where it, the, the original location of, of, the, of the data that it read in. Like if I'm updating a record and it's on page one, 
I could potentially write it out to page two, my change to it. But now the system has to know that, OK, if I want the latest version, it's over here. Right? There's an extra metadata we're going to maintain to figure out what was dirty, who dirtied it, uh, who updated it, and how to reconcile whether that transaction has committed or not, and therefore what the current state of the, the page on disk is should be the correct one or not. So again, things we need to guarantee to make sure our data is durable, that any changes the transaction makes, uh, once we tell the outside world your, your, your transaction is committed, that those things are persistent and durable on disk. Right? And then we don't want any partial changes, we don't want any torn updates, and we don't want any, don't want any lost updates. So the primitives we're going to do, use to, to achieve this are the following, the undo and redo. Right, we talked a little bit of this also, too, with the Delta storage stuff in MVCC. Right? I said that was like a, like a, almost like an undo record where you're, you were putting the diff of what the, the, the old version was with the new version. And then if you ever needed to go back and to the older version, you could just reapply the change, which is essentially undoing the, the previous change. Right? So it's basically the same idea. It's like a diff. So the undo would be the operation would be removing the effects of an uncompleted aborted transaction. And the redo would be re reapplying the, the effects of any committed transaction back onto the, the logical tuple, or the logical record, or the logical data. So that put us back in, into the correct state. So now how the data system is going to implement undo and redo are going to depend on actually how it manages memory in the buffer pool. So let, let's look at an example now. So we now have two transactions. T1 is going to read A, write A. And T2 is going to read B, write B. All right, so say we have a single page in our, in our database. It's out in, a, in the very beginning, we have a cold buffer pool. Everything's out on disk. So T1 is going to start. It's going to read A. What do you have to do? We go fetch that page. We got the disk. It brings it into the memory. Right? Now we do a write on A. And for this one, we're, it's assume it's a single version. We're just going to write to up, up, update the new value of A into the page. Now T2 starts after a context switch. T2 is going to read, read B. The, the page that contains B is already in memory, so we don't do anything there. We just re read the value there. But now we're going to write B. Again, same thing. It's single version, so we're just going to update B with the new value. So now we go ahead and commit. Right? And again, I said that we need any time that a transaction commits, in order to make sure that the data is durable, any changes they made is durable, we need to write something out the disk with, with, that, you know, with their changes. So in this case here, we have to potentially write out this page that contains the, the change that, 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 that transaction 2 made back out the disk. What's the obvious problem here? What's that? Right. The problem is that there's a change to A in the same page, and we have to decide whether we're, we're allowed to write the disk or not. All right? So say we did. We just flushed the whole page. Now on disk, we have the update to A from T1 and update to uh, B by T2. So then at this point here, we commit. We tell the outside world, transaction 2, you've committed, you're done. Right? That's fine. But now T1 is going to abort. And again, we assume we didn't know this. So for whatever reason, the client disappears or something happens, T1 gets aborted. But now if there's a crash, uh, you know, we have now on disk, we have a change from T1 who shouldn't have committed. But so in order to make sure that we can roll that back, we got to go back out the disk, fetch that page back in, reverse the change, and then write it back out. Right? So this would be durable for T2. It would be durable for T1, but that's not, not actually what we want. Right? Because T1 shouldn't have anything durable because it, it, it didn't commit. So that's bad. So... The question we have to figure out is, when is it OK for us to write out dirty pages to disk? And what is the requirement that when we say when a transaction commits, what do we have to do with any of the, its dirty pages? Do we have to write them, make sure they're all written out the disk? Or can we do something else? So there can be two policies now we have in our buffer pool implementation that are going to determine the, the, you know, these two questions. And again, as I said before, when we talked about we, after the midterm, the reason why we're talking about all these things now, even though you know, the first couple of lectures were about the buffer pool because you need to understand what the buffer pool is, then understand what transactions are, then we can describe how we actually make, make our buffer pool aware of transactions. All right, so this is why we're going back to, to buffer pool stuff again. So the first policy we have to deal with is called the steel policy. And this is going to determine whether the data system is allowed to have an uncommitted transaction 
overwrite the latest committed version of a, of a page, just assume we're dealing with pages, the latest committed version of a, of a page or value to a tuple out on disk, even though that transaction has not committed yet. Basically, are we allowed to take a page from a transaction that, that, that from a page that's been modified by a transaction or a value that's been modified by a transaction that's currently in our buffer pool? Are we allowed to steal that frame from it, write it out to disk, even though the, the transaction that modified the thing we're writing out to disk has not committed yet? So if you, if you, with the steal policy, this is allowed. The no steal, this is, it is not allowed. So under no steal, we say any page that's been modified by a transaction that has not committed cannot leave the buffer pool, cannot be written to disk. Is this clear? Okay. The next policy is called the fourth policy. And this is going to determine whether the data is required to have any pages that were modified by a transaction flushed out to disk when before they're allowed to say that we've committed them. Again, the client, the application could tell, send the commit command through SQL to, to the database system. The data system can, doesn't have to respond right away. It has, it has to figure out, okay, what I need to write out the disk. And only when those things are flushed to non-vault storage under the force policy, or if you're, force, you're, if you're running with the force policy, then you say, yes, you, you've committed. So force, you say this is required. You have to flush everything. No force is, is not required. Yes? So he says, isn't this a huge bottleneck to require anybody to flush dirty pages when they commit out to disk before you say they're allowed to commit? Right. Is this a huge bottleneck? Yes. Example. Right? So in this setup here, it's going to run the same transactions, T1, T2, read on A, write on A, read on B, write on B. Uh, but now we're going to do a no steal force policy. Right? All right. So T1's going to start. It's going to read A. That's, that's on disk. We bring that into buffer pool. Then we do a write on A. We update A3, or to update A to 3 here. Then now there's a context switch. Uh, T2 is going to read B. That's in memory. That's fine. Then it's going to write B. It updates now B here. And then it goes to commit. So under the fourth policy, this says that all their changes made by T2 have to be written to disk at this point before we can tell the outside world that our transaction is committed. Because as we said, the problem is that there is a uh, there's a record that was modified by T1, and T1 has not committed, and under no steal, you can't write any values uh, that were modified by a transaction that has not been committed to disk before they commit. Right? So in this case here, the way we'd have to handle this under no steal and force is that we'd have to make a copy of the page, uh, only apply the change that, that T2 made to this copy page, and then write that out to disk. Once that's flushed, then we go tell, uh, tell the outside world that T2 is committed, and we're, and we're fine. And then at some later point, when, when T, T1 starts again and it aborts, it's trivial for us to roll back this change, assuming we have undue information in for, for T1 to reverse the change that it made to, to the page. Yes? The statement is, could you, do, could you set up a barrier so that uh, anybody that has, is going to touch this page has to commit? Or what are you, what are you saying, sorry? Is this like a, uh, you can set up steel comp page, and then you only flush out this page when steel comp is committed. This, you say steel count, like a counter? Yeah, something like that. Uh, how about this work? So a counter, you set a counter to do what? Sorry, like the number, the number of transactions that have updated this? <laughs> Yes. And then maybe T2 can just wait a little bit until T1 is committed. And then you check uh, everybody, T1, T2 who has touched this page uh, has command to commit, and then you can flush it out. OK. So his, his potential solution for this, this, all this extra work we're doing would be you, you periodically go to see, uh, you, before you can flush the page out the disk for T, when T2 commits, you wait some amount of time, undefined how long, but some amount of time, and then at some, for all the transactions that have modified the page to then be, okay, I've commit, sort of group them up, and then, then flush the page out in a single batch. 
So what if my transaction runs for an hour, right? Is T, T1 runs for an hour, T2 takes one millisecond. Am I gonna wait an hour? All right, so the advantage of this is that obviously rolling back is easy. The disadvantage is that the 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 copy and the and the copy and the reversal, if necessary, on abort, these are on the critical path. Like when I commit, I gotta go back here and make the copy, apply my change, or reverse the change from the other guy, right? I'm trying to do this when I commit, and th this is expensive. All right? What's another big problem with this approach? Yes. So he says, this is required so the buffer pool manager to be aware of the contents. Uh, potentially, but that's OK. We're the data system. We, we can control that. Yes? If they both write to B and then a T2 writes B to A and A, T1 writes B to 9, and then like. I mean, it's, 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 assume there's two phase locking. Assume that there's concurrency or something. something there's another higher level of mechanism that's protecting them from trying to write the same thing. So there's another big problem. Yes? How do you implement like a no fee policy where a single transaction would probably pass a so many pages of eventually All right, so, so she nailed it, right? So that, this is the big problem. So I'll, just re I'll, I'll repeat what you said. You have the right answer. I'll repeat what you said uh, in, in a different way. So the, the problem with this approach is that you can't modify a, a, a transaction cannot modify a portion of the database that exceeds the amount of memory available in the buffer pool. So if my database is one gigabyte in size, uh, but my buffer pool is only 500, 500 megabytes, I can only bring 500 megabytes in, I'll modify those 500 megabytes, then I try to go get the next, the next page, and I have to abort because now I can't flush out any of those dirty pages, I've, and I've used all my memory. So essentially what you're saying, I can't modify you can't support transactions that fit that have to touch data that exceeds the amount of memory available under the the no steal policy. All right. So to be clear, this is a straw man approach. This is a terrible idea. I'm just trying to show you the the, the implications of the design decisions of steal and no force or no steal and force, and we'll see why the the steal no force approach is better with the right ahead log. So that answer your question. Yeah. All right. Do you think I have a billion rows? I can only I I, I I have enough memory. My table has a billion tuples. I only have enough memory to keep 1 million tuples in memory. Uh, I can't update all 1 billion. All right? If, again, if I want to do that in the context of a transaction. All right. So this is the easiest approach to implement. Um, the, the nice thing about it, and actually, even though it's, it has some issues, is that since the database is only on disk, it's only going to contain data from or updates from committed transactions. When I crash to come back, my database is already in a correct uh, consistent state because it's not going to have uh, updates from transactions that didn't commit. So I don't have to reverse anything. So I come back, and my database is, is all ready to go. Right? Um, and then I never need to also, when, uh, after a crash, I need to go, never need to go back and redo the changes from a committed transaction because I know before I told the outside world, all those changes were flushed to disk. Right? And as I said, you can't do this in a... Uh, you can't do this if your, data, your transaction needs to auto modify the, the, you know, a portion of the database that exceeds the amount of memory to you. This is also really bad, too, as well, because going back here, example, for example, assume this, this T1 didn't actually abort, right? So I flushed uh, T2, wrote that out the disk. Then this guy does commit, and I have to write this page out again. So I had to write the page twice for these two, these two transactions. And so on SSDs, you can only write to them so many times before the cell burns out. It's like 100,000 or something. They've gotten better. But like in this case here, I would have excessive rights because I would have transactions, update a page, flush out the, the change to the disk, then the next transaction may update to the same page, and then immediately flushes out the same page over, over and over again. So you'd burn out the disk pretty quickly. So shadow paging is an implementation of no steel force that avoids some of these problems. It's still not ideal. This is not the way you want to build a database system, uh, although there's one or two examples that does. Um, but let's see how we can make this make the, the no steel force policy more tractable. And again, that'll segue into why we want to do write ahead logging. Yes? No steel force kind of seems contradictory to me because no steel says you can't write it out until you're committed. Mm -hmm. And force says you have to write it out before you commit. Uh, when I say before you commit, like meaning like 
when I call commit, then, then you flush everything out. But before then, it's like if I'm up, a, a query, a query one does an update, then I have query two, and then I commit. Between query one and query two, I can't flush anything out. Four says, the, the client says, commit my transaction, then I write everything out, and then when that's done, I tell the outside world I'm, I'm committed. So if you commit, if you say commit, and then you like crash. So his question is, if you say commit and then you crash, what is actually correct, right? Well, from the database system perspective, it, all, it only matters, like, did you get everything out the disk? Doesn't matter whether you actually told the outside world you committed or not, because we can't, we can't, like, we can't, uh, how do you say this? We can't guarantee you'll get that message, right? So like, you tell me to commit, I flush everything into disk, I'm, I send you a network message to say, yes, you're committed, and either you crash, the network crash, or I crash before you get that message. When you come back, on disk is still the, 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 the result of the committed transaction. So from the database system perspective, it's your responsibility, well, not you, I mean, the application. It's the application responsibility to figure out, okay, well, I didn't get the commit message that I thought I was gonna get, did I actually commit that transaction? The data system can't do that for you. And once once you leave the confines of the data system itself, like like we 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 can't control things. Yes. So are you saying that the database commit is the writing to disk? The question is is am I saying that the commit is atomic of writing to disk? No, right? Because you you can only guarantee four kilobyte writes to hard to hardware. So what if you're like both part of the system and crash? Like uh, so statement is. Yeah, so, so a statement is, if uh, a question is, what if I write part of my changes to disk and then I crash, would I have to do some extra work to recover things? In my, my toy example here, yes. Like if I update multiple pages and I only write one of them, I have to come back and figure out what I missed. Shadow paging will handle that. We'll see that now. All right, so um, again, I think we mentioned shadow paging in the beginning when we started talking about current control, but now we could go into a bit more detail. So the basic idea is that instead of making changes to you know, sort of a single version of the database, we're actually going to maintain two versions. And again, this looks a lot like MVCC. It's just now we're doing it at the page level instead of the tuple level. Um, and so the master version of, of, in a shadow paging system, the master version of the database will only contain changes from committed transactions. And then the shadow version will be this temporary space where we're copying pages before we write to them. We copy pages in the shadow version apply our change to, to, to sort of a staging area. And then when we say what a transaction wants to commit, there'll be this root pointer uh, page that points to the, the, whether it's the, the, the master version or the shadow version, and it's always gonna point to the master version. So we just change that pointer to now point to the new shadow version, and then that atomically becomes the, the new master. And that avoids the problem that he brought up, of like how do I make sure that I don't have torn rights uh, when my transaction commits? Because I'd make sure all my, my writes to the shadow copy are staged, and flushed. Once that they're durable, then I just do atomic swap on, on the, the, the root pointer. All right? So again, this is an example of, of no steel force. Uh, again, it's kind of muddy because you could flush out shadow copy pages to disk. Um, you good? Okay. <laughs> Could have been worse, right? Um, <laughs> okay, all right. So, all right, so he here's the setup here. All right, so we have memory, we have disk. And then we have this, this database root that just points to this you know, location of, of the page table, right? And then the page table just points to pages that, that are on disk. So my, I, my new transaction comes along. Uh, and I'm going to make a new shadow page table where the, initially the page table is going to point to the same pages that are on disk as, as the master version. But then as I, st as I stop, right, yeah, so we're only going to modify the shadow copy and the, 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 the master will be read only. So now anytime I want to update data in a page, uh, I'm first going to make a copy of the page on disk to a, a, a new page, update my page table to point to this new page, and then apply my changes there. All right, so I update four, same thing. I update two, same thing like that, all right? So now, the, if I crash at any time here, when I come back, the, the database root's gonna point to the master page table, and it's only gonna contain cha changes of committed transactions. I wouldn't see any, any of these other pages here, right? So if I do commit, 
then what I need to do is do a compare and swap on the root, uh, the root pointer here to update the page on disk to say, here's the new, new, the new location of, of the shadow page table or the master page table, right? And assuming this is stored in a four kilobyte page, I can guarantee that write is atomic on, on, on hardware. So if it happens, uh, if it happens before and I don't crash, then this becomes the new master. If I don't write it before I crash, then no problem because it was pointing to the, the master one. And then this the changes that were made down here technically never happened. I didn't tell the outside world I committed. Yes? How much fragmentation? We'll get to that. He says, how much fragmentation would this cause? Uh, a lot. We'll get to that. Right? So now once I've, I've told the outside world this guy's committed because I've now pointed this, uh, I can have some kind of garbage collection mechanism to blow away the old master page table. Uh, this becomes the new master, and this is now a consistent snapshot of the database or a consistent version of the database. Yes? Yeah, so you, cr correct. You would have to flush the page table contents of the disk, yes. No, no, no. So the statement is, I have to flush this out the disk. You're correct. This is, say, assume this is not four kilobytes. Mm -hmm. How do I make sure this is done atomically? I don't have to do this atomically, right? Because I flush this out the disk, right? The, 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 it's basically the directory, page directory. I flush this out the disk. If that if that crashes, then who cares? I come back. the The root pointer is still pointing to the to the to the, oh. the old one, right? So you have to make sure you change the db root pointer after. It. Yeah, this is the last step. Is always change this. Once that is written to disk and flushed, then I up then then everyone everyone comes after me by this transaction will will see this, right? Then at some later point, we have to do you know we do garbage collection and then we, we prune all these, right? So recovery is super easy, and rollbacks are super easy. Like, if, if, assuming there's not a crash, if I need to roll back a transaction, I blow away the shadow page table, right, and then make a new one for the next transaction, right? So that that's easy. Um, if I need to, uh, if there's a crash, I come back again. The the root pointer is always going to point to uh, the latest latest master version. So therefore, I don't want to say consistent or snapshot. Right? It's the latest master version. I don't have to do any additional work to, to put me back in the correct state. I immediately only have changes that were made by transactions that I've told the outside world I've committed. So we're good, All right? And there's nothing, nothing to redo. As he pointed out, this has a lot of problems. Um, so this is shadow paging, as I, think I said before. This is what IBM originally invented for, for system R back in the 1970s. So when they were building the first relational database system at IBM, this is the approach that they came up with, right? Um, but then they end up abandoning it in the 1980s when they rebuilt a new relational database system, DB2, that they were actually going to sell to the real world, to sell, sell, sell commercially, because um, the system R was only a research project. When they built DB2, they scrapped all this and switched to the right-hand log approach. Right? So there's a lot of problems. First one is copying the entire page table each time is expensive. You can avoid that by using a, like a B plus tree structure or tree structure where the, the database root essentially is the root of the tree. And then any time you need to make a new page or modify a page, you make copies of branches in the tree. This is essentially what LMDB does, uh, which does, is a system that exists today. Um, but again, like you, it's, 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 a lot, it's a lot more work you're doing to maintain these sort of coarse green versions. The commit over high, overhead is super high as well, right? Because not only do I have to flush every single page I modified, I got to flush the page table, and I got to flush the root, right? Uh, so that that's that's going to be a long, take a long time. The point that he brought up, which he's correct about fragmentation, right? Sort of going back here, uh, say I bulk loaded the data at the beginning when it was just these pages here, and maybe I, I I have a cluster and index, and things are sorted nicely in some some primary key order. But now, after I run a transaction, uh, now I got a bunch of a bunch of holes on disk, right? Assuming this is like a you know this sequential file on, on disk, and there's a bunch of holes in it, they're now going to gain data from new pages that, that I create in the future. So now if I want to do a sequential scan, as I'm going along, I may have to skip over pages that, that aren't visible to me or have been garbage collected from aborted transactions, right? I may end up reading a lot more data uh, and do more random access than I would have, have to do otherwise, right? And that was one of the big reasons IBM uh, got rid of this in the, in the 1980s, because again, back then, disks were super slow. The difference between sequential scan and random access were, was much more, much larger than they are they were now, and 
if with with shadow paging you had way more random 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 reads and random writes. The other challenge also too in this scenario is we actually can only support one writer transaction at a time. Right? Because we don't since we're not maintaining we, we essentially have the same problem we had before. We could have two transactions that are running simultaneously, make updates to different objects that are just stored in the same page. And when we go to commit, we have to make sure that uh, you know, we, we reverse the change from the uncommitted transaction and let the committed transaction actually go out the disk. You can avoid this by batching things up, sort of what he to, alluded to before. But as I said, like what happens if one transaction takes an hour, one transaction takes one millisecond? Do you wait the entire time or abort one of them? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so his question is, uh, does, this, does this solve the issue that she brought up that you can't modify a, a database that exceeds the amount of memory within a single transaction? Yes, because you could, you could have a buffer pool swap out you know, the uncommitted shadow pages to disk just fine. And again, not an issue. If you crash and come back, those, those shadow pages are just ignored. right? You don't have to reverse anything. So. As I said, like LMBDB does this. This is what IBM did back in the day. CouchDB does or did use some, something similar to this. Um, but probably a well-known system uh, that you've, everyone had to use for the first project that used to do something like this was actually SQLite. And so we'll see. We'll just see. This is sort of a variation of the of, of the shadow paging, where instead of copying the page and then writing writing your change to the copy page, they would just copy the original page. And then modify the sort of the master version, and so basically, let's, let's see how they handle this, right? So I say also too, this is how they used to do uh, handle recovery before 2010. After 2010, they switch they switch over to the Red Hat log for performance reasons. Uh, but you can still get this you still get this 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 functionality in SQLite if you enable what they call rollback mode. All right. So basically, what happens is now when a transaction is going to modify a page again, also. SQLite also only has a single writer thread, so you can have multiple reader threads, but only one thread can one transaction can write to the database at a time. So we, we don't avoid that. We don't have the batching problem we mentioned before. So when transaction is going to modify uh, a page. The first thing it's going to do is copy, bring the page into memory, but then copy the unmodified page out to this journal file, like on the local file system. And then you go ahead and make the modification to the page in memory, and you're fine. You're done. Then I go ahead and modify, uh, modify, modify page three, same thing, copy it out into the journal file on disk. So then now, at some later point, the buffer manager says, OK, well, I have these pages that I'm running out of memory. Let me, let me write out a dirty page out to disk. And you would go and overwrite the, what I'll call it again, the master version, the master copy of the, in the database file. Right? So we'd write out a dirty page two here. But then let's say now our, 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 the system crashes, the process gets killed. Uh, and we lose everything in memory, but we've already flushed out a dirty page too. So then upon recovery, we would look at this journal file, because that's been flushed to disk, and go look at this and say, okay, is this correspond to a transaction that, that, that didn't commit? If yes, let me go copy the original uh, pages that are in my journal file back into memory, then write them back out to, to, to disk to overwrite any, 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 any pages that were modified by the transaction that didn't commit. All right? Statement is: Do you only delete the journal file after the after you've either reversed the changes of an uncommitted transaction or a transaction has committed? Correct. Yes. So the the SQLite documentation is is fascinating. I encourage everyone to follow this link, and they, they describe exactly how this works. And what's awesome about SQLite is too, they have to support all sorts of crazy hardware and operating systems, not just Linux and not just like nice laptops. Like they're supporting embedded devices, running on like airplanes and. Uh, satellites and boats and things like that. So, you know, weird architectures that you never thought about. And on the the semantics of what it actually means to flush things to disk, and what the OS would support in these different embedded devices can vary widely. Um, and so, there's a bunch of this seems sort of expensive to do, but this was portable. This technique would work in a bunch of different uh, bunch of different environments other than Linux. That's part of the reason they did this. But they eventually switch switch to the write ahead log. All right. So. Uh, Shadow paging, both the SQLite version and the IBM version, uh, is not great because it's going to require us to perform a bunch of uh, random writes to non-continuous pages on disk. 
Um, and as we said, we want to maximize the amount of sequential writes we have and sequential reads, necessary, if possible, um, to, to you know, improve performance. The other thing we're also deciding we want to make it also is that, well, maybe we, 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 we certainly don't want to lose data. So we, we want our recovery protocol to make sure we, we put, put us back to the correct state. But maybe we don't want to pay the big runtime overhead that the shadow paging had to do about copying pages while we're running transactions because you know we're, we're not going to crash that often. Yes? I see why it will cost attention, right? So why do, why do shadow paging only support one writer transaction? This question is, why does shadow paging only support uh, one writer transaction? Because going back here, we're actually did, yeah, the major, did you see the light here, right? So if I have multiple transactions update page two, one of those transaction commits, and I write out page two to disk, uh, how do I make sure that like I, I the, the the first transaction whose, whose commit record should be there, those get persisted after recovery, and and I don't have the other ones. Okay, but I see this like the later one, if the later one commits, it will also write to each. Let's say the later one cr you crash before the, the second one commits. Now you come back, and, and page two contains updates from transaction T1 and T2. The journal file contains neither updates. So now, how, how do you how do you Keep T1, but reverse T2. Okay, but I thought they all write their commits saved to the same yeah, so, so again, like, so you either have to batch them, right? Then they all stage the changes to, you know, to, well, the journal file in this case here, it's not staging changes. It's just a copy of the original version of the page. You stage your changes in memory. Then if you run out of memory, then you write it out to disk, right? So either the... So either the, uh, all the transactions have to commit exactly at the same time, or I need a way to reverse or partially reverse the, some of the changes to the page so that T1 committed, their changes are, get, get retained, T2 gets a roll back, I have to reverse their changes. This protocol, as, as I'm describing here, doesn't handle that. So the way you would do this in, in shadow paging is, is you would batch transactions. So like every five milliseconds, all transactions have to commit. So my transaction finishes in one millisecond, then I go to commit, then I have to wait to the five milliseconds, and then, I, then I'm allowed to, you know, then, then I'm allowed to commit. And that's fine if things can be broken up to five millisecond chunks, right? If your transaction runs for an hour, then that's not going to work. Because every, now everyone else has to wait for an hour. Yes? What does this mean, like, optimally, we're going to use only, like, half the discharge before the end? Right, so th this example here, does this mean that I can only use half the disk storage available to, to to run this, you know, this example here. Yes, because in theory, a transaction could, could modify the entire database. So my journal file needs to be the same, you know, have the same amount of space available to me as the entire database. Yes. Okay. I don't want to dwell too much on, on shadow paging because you don't want to do it, trust me. Um, so the approach we are going to use is called write-ahead logging. And again, I said, this is what pretty much Every database system uh, does. Even the log structure databases, we'll talk about in a second, they're going to have a write-ahead log. And the idea here is that we're now going to maintain a separate log file on disk that's going to contain the changes that the transactions made to the database while they were running. Right? Assume the log is on stable storage, meaning like we can, we can, no matter what, we can, you know, if lightning strikes the machine or whatever, we can always get back the log, and, and that's enough to put us back to, to recreate the database. Right? Because the log record's going to, the logs going to contain enough information to undo and redo any operation that any transaction made to, to the database. And we can either reverse the change or reapply the change as needed. And so the key concept, the key requirement we're going to have in, on, with write ahead logging is this part here. And that is the database system has to write the, and flush to disk any, any log record that a transaction uh, created when they modified a page or, to a, or an object. That has to be written to disk and flushed before you're allowed to write the page or the object that was modified to disk. So if I have a transaction that updates a single record, I'm going to create a log record that corresponds to the update, and I'm going to, I'm going to modify the page. Before the buffer pool manager can flush that page out the disk, we have to flush the log record first. Right, that's quite, so it's called write-ahead logs. So you're writing out the log record ahead of the page that was modified. All right? So this is, this is an example of steel, no force. So steel means that we're going to be able to write out dirty pages uh, made, that were modified by transactions before those transactions commit. 
So as long as we write out the log records, that's okay. And then no force says that we're not required to flush out the dirty pages when a transaction commits uh, to tell them, tell the outside world you've committed. But you do have to flush the log records. Because the log records are going to be enough to tell us what the transaction actually did. Yes? Yes. Right. So isn't this just like a doubling up of log-based storage? And why can't we just use the log from? from, from okay, so his statement is, and we'll get to this in a second. I have a slide. His statement is, hey, this sounds like log structured storage we talked about before. Isn't this the same thing? Yes. The log structured storage systems are still going to maintain a right-hand log. Is that doubling up? Yes. Because you could, we'll say in a second. So, so because in a log structured system, you're going you're to start buffering all these lo these changes, right? <coughs> And the, are they starting basically the same thing? At a high level, yes. But the, 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 the log buffer is, that's in memory, that's coming with the log structure of storage, that is going to be a, that's going to be, is a tree data structure that's different than, than the right ahead log. The right ahead log is just simply appending things. I didn't talk about the log structure merge trees, but it's, it's more than just like, you know, appending to a file. There's, there's an index on top of it, and that we ignored. Assumption here is that writing the log is a lot faster than just writing it to the database. Yes. So if I so statement is, is the assumption here that writing to the log is going to be a lot faster than writing to the database? The answer is yes. So think I have a transaction that's going to update a thousand tuples, and say there's a thousand tuples that are stored in a thousand different pages, but I'm only going to update for each tuple one byte. So I would have one thousand one byte log records roughly, to correspond to those thousand changes, or I could have one thousand four kilobyte page pages that were modified and write to disk. I can write you know, significantly less data out to disk through a write-ahead log than updating the pages. OK. You good? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Sorry, it's, mind, yeah, it seems like your mind's blown by this. I know. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Any other questions? Sorry. OK. So again, the, we're going to stage all the changes, all the transactions changes are going to be in, 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 in our in, in volatile storage, in the buffer pool. I say usually back by buffer pool. That's actually not entirely correct. You, depending on implementation, you would have separate memory allocated on the side. Whether or not it's back by the buffer pool, which knows what it goes to directly to the log record, or to the, sorry, the log file, depends on implementation. Um, and then again, all the pages, that, all the, the log records that correspond to the, the modified pages has to be flushed to disk before we're allowed to overwrite the, the sort of the master version, the single version of, of the of the database on disk. And again, we can't tell the outside world that our transaction is committed until all those records have been flushed to disk. There's a bunch of systems where this is actually not true, uh, where maybe like by default, you won't actually wait till they're flushed. You do like asynchronous commit. So like you would say, all right, well, I've, I've staged them. They'll get written out in five milliseconds, but I'm not going to wait for that. right? If you really care about not losing data, you would actually wait till these things are actually flushed out. Um, the Again, it, it, this is something the data systems can't figure out for you. It depends on what your failure tolerance is. Like, if you're okay with losing maybe the last five milliseconds of their data, then you don't want to wait for the flush, right? If you don't want to lose that, uh, then you do not, you know, th then you definitely wait for the flush. The the worst system that actually that, that I've ever seen to do something like this is actually was Mongo, um, as I wear the shirt. Uh, <laughs> in the original version of MongoDB, when you did a write, they didn't do transactions. You would say do, you would do a write. And then they would immediately come back and say, yep, we got your right. But like, not only at that point, it was only in the network layer. Like, they, all they were acknowledging is that they got your right message. It, it didn't say it actually applied the right. It didn't say that actually right actually made it to disk. It said, yep, I saw it. Good. All right, good. Right? And then the only way to determine whether you're actually right made it to disk, you had to send another message and say, hey, that thing I just told you to write, did you actually write the disk? And then it would actually wait for the flush. Um, so. This is like early 2010s. They would have amazing benchmark numbers because they were doing this, <laughs> this thing, a trick. I don't. A trick's not the right word. Uh, anyway, so like, out of box. <laughs> take that offline. Um, uh, no, I mean, so in, in the newer versions, they don't do that anymore, right? They act, they now have multi-document transactions. They now, you know, if they have a write-ahead log, they 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 they'll wait till things flush if, if you want to, right? 
The old, the, the early version cut some corners. How about that? All right. So the, the way it's going to work is that we're going to have this write-ahead log file, and then every time a transaction starts, we're going to have a begin entry, a begin log record that's going to mark the starting point for a given transaction. Um, most systems don't add the begin record until you actually not. Not when you call begin, but actually when you actually issue a query that, mod query that modifies the database, right? Because if I call begin and then just commit immediately, it's, I don't want to write anything at the disk for that, right? It didn't actually do anything, all right? And then when a transaction commits, we got to write a commit record in the log, and then we got to make sure that the all the log records that correspond to that transaction that came before this commit, those have to be flushed out the disk before we tell the outside world you've committed. So this, this begin is essentially a uh, like a guidepost just to tell the data system that there's not going to be any log records for this transaction beyond this point, because right? otherwise, without begin, you may just scan to the beginning of the file just to see whether there's, there's some some modification that the transaction made. And so each log record is going to contain some basic information. This is a, this is a gross over, oversimplification, but uh, for our purposes, this is enough to understand what's going on. So there'll be some transaction ID. Again, that could be like a timestamp or some logical counter thing we talked about before. Then there'll be an object ID of the thing that's actually getting modified, a page, a tuple, whatever. Then we'll have the before value, and that's going to allow us to do undo, so to reverse the change. And then we'll have the after value, and that's going to allow us to reapply the change. So in the if you're doing a pen-only MVCC, like in Postgres, they don't actually need to store the before value because they're always creating a new tuple a new physical, you know, new physical version was always a brand new tuple. You never need to reverse the, the previous one, right? So they only need to do redo. They don't need to do undo. All right, so let's see, see an example here. So here now we have in memory, we have our buffer pool, and we're going to have this, this red head log buffer. So when T1 starts, uh, we're going to add a pendant entry into our, to our, to our in-memory buffer pool, or in-memory buffer for, this, for the red head log to say T1 has begun. Then we do a write on A. The first thing we need to do is to put a log record in memory that says, here's the change that's being made. So we have the transaction ID T1. We have object A as the identifier. The before value is 1. And then the new value we're trying to write into it is 8. So once we do this, we have to do this first. Then we're allowed to go ahead and write the change to the page. Right? And the reason why we, we, we have to do it in this order because we don't want to have this get flushed out to disk before our log record does. All right, so we'll talk about uh, log sequence numbers next next class. But basically, every log record is going to get a, a, its own LSN, its own identifier, in sequential order. And then for, in the page here, we'll mark here's the here's the log log number or log record number uh, of the last modification to this page. So we would know that if we write this thing out the disk, we need to make sure that the log sequence number. Uh, the log sequence number that corresponds to the change has, has been written out the disk. That's basically like a watermark to keep keep track of like is it okay is it safe to write this? So make sure that happens in the right order. We write to the, the log record first, get a log sequence number, and then we update the page. Okay, we'll cover that next class. Then I do a write on B, same thing, get a new log record, uh, put that in the right head log buffer, and then I update the page. Now I go ahead and commit. I have to flush the uh, the the log buffer in memory, rush, write that out the disk. Then once that is on disk and it's durable, then I know it's safe to tell the outside world the transaction has committed. If now there's a crash at some later point and all our contents of memory are, are, are blown away, before we write out the dirty page uh, that was in the buffer pool, that's OK, because the log record has enough information for us to recover the, the, the state of that page. Right? We'll, we'll talk about this in the next class. But basically, you upon startup, you say, OK, what's well, in the write-ahead log? Oh, I see a transaction that has committed. Let me go make sure that the pages that it modified were have, 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 have that the any of the changes that made to the data have been applied to the to those pages. Right? And we'll talk about how to do that next time. Yes. Um, if you use not fork on the GUI, can we ensure it's easy to read across different transactions? Like if I just uh, modify my changes equal to and then you write a log file. It don't necessarily flush out the disk, and then you abort. But the user see. Uh, wait, wait. So, 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 if you, if I write my changes, yes. you call commit. You call commit. But then you abort. How can you abort if you say you commit? No, no, no like crashes. Okay, crashes. Yes. But the system tell you that you're committed successfully. 
because you write that on Yes, log. yes. But the content doesn't get flagged out. Yes. The log or the, or the page? This, the, this thing. This didn't get rid of this, correct, right? Yeah, and then I query for the value again. OK. Oh, so, so yeah, so the scenario is, how does this work? If, if my log record got flushed, I tell the outside where to committed, but then I crash and I lose my contents of the buffer pool of the dirty page before it gets written to disk, what happens when I come back, when the system starts back up? What happens is, uh, before you're allowed to start executing queries, the system has to go through recovery mode, where it would look in the write-ahead log and say, OK, did all the changes for any transactions I told, that, that I was told committed, did those things actually get, get updated? To, did the changes of those pages actually get applied to disk? If yes, I'm good. If no, I reapply them. Once that recovery check is done, then you can start executing queries. And then you're guaranteed to have not have the anomaly you're talking about. OK. So uh, an obvious bottleneck is going to be, or obvious problem is going to be that if every transaction says commit and I have to flush the you know, changes out the disk, that's going to become slow because now I have to wait for the if my if two transactions commit sort of almost at the same time, but one gets in before another, the second transaction has to wait for the first f sync to come back. Uh, does everyone know what f sync is? It's like the POSIX command to flush, right? And, and the OS will block your your request until the hardware says I've I've safely written a disk. Whether how safe it is depends on hardware, but we can cover that up later. Um, sometimes there's like a, a battery back buffer down there, but we don't care the database system. So I call f sync on the first transaction, it gets flushed to disk, but then I have to, the second transaction was you know, maybe like a half a microsecond behind, but it didn't get part of that flush. It has to wait for that flush to come back, and then it can call flush if written to disk. Right? So you're basically now, the, 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 the speed in which you can execute and commit transactions depends heavily on what the hardware can actually support. Right? If your flush time is five milliseconds, then you can only commit a transaction every, once every five milliseconds, and that's really slow. So a simple optimization we can do is actually to batch transactions together uh, so that we can have multiple flushes uh, combined together and then we can amortize the cost of, of doing the, you know, of, of doing the f-sync, of doing the flush, so that transactions that are roughly close to each other will all be, will piggyback off each other and the system will have better throughput. So best case scenario, you're the last transaction before the, before the flush, then you don't wait. If you're, if you're the first transaction, then you have to wait for the queue to get filled up, or whatever mechanism you're using to decide when to flush. So the way this works is that you basically maintain multiple right head log buffers now. And when a transaction starts, it puts all its log records in the first buffer. You keep writing into it and so forth. All right? T1 start, T2 starts running. It puts its log buffer here, right? Make change there. And now at this point here, our log buffer is full. So we're going to go ahead and uh, write this one out the disk. We then flip a pointer in the log manager to say, okay, here's the, now, the next log buffer everyone's going to fill up. And then we start appending all our changes there. So, so while we're, our transaction is running, uh, we can keep put new entries into the, to the second log buffer while the, the, you know, the disk is flushing out the first one. All right? And then, say we both of you guys commit, uh, obviously we don't want to wait for other transactions to show up and maybe fill up the log buffer, then we go in and flush. So there'll be like a simple timeout mechanism that says, if it's been you know five milliseconds, it's usually, usually a good number. If it's been five milliseconds, then go flush out whatever's on whatever's in the, the buffer now. All right. And again, that's okay uh, with with Red Hat log. For it's okay to have log records from transactions that have not committed yet, because we have the undo and redo information. We know how to reverse them. If there's a crash, and we come back, and we got to see did this transaction actually commit or not. Right, so we go commit, and then the flush after occurs after some some timeout. Okay, just to summarize the the, the two different policies, the the steel versus steel no steel versus force no force. The if you're worried about runtime performance, like how fast can my transactions actually run uh, under normal operations, the steel no force policy, the right ahead log one, that's the best. Right, because the log entries, uh, that's cheap, cheap to generate. I don't have to block transactions to flush all the changes from dirty pages when they commit. Right? I'm just flushing out the log records. Uh, the, the slowest one will be the shadow paging, because I'm copying these pages, sort of these coarse grains, updating the, the directory, the page table, and so forth. Right? At runtime, though, sorry, at recovery time, the, 
the shadow paging approach is actually going to be the fastest because I don't do anything. I just come back, right? And I don't do any undo. I don't need to redo because my master version of the database for master master copy is going to be always consistent. In the case of uh, write ahead log, it's going to be slower because it's going to have to look at this log and figure out what was actually running at the time I crashed and and put the database back into the correct state. Yes. Uh, this question is why is it so? Why is it no steel, no force uh, existing versus force and steel? So I don't think you can actually do this, right? If you can't, this doesn't make sense. I can't write anything out, but I don't require you to flush anything. Uh, is it, would this actually be correct? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's basically you would do you would just write a head log, but you can't flush dirty pages out. But that defeats the purpose of write a head log, right? Uh, this one. Uh, this is sort of what SQLite's kind of doing, right? Because you can you can flush out dirty pages. Uh, yeah, but you still require you still require still require you to flush out the pages when, when you commit. So, yeah, yeah. So th this would be this would be SQLite here, right? The right ahead log is going to be faster though. Most people are going to pay most. Most systems are going to assume that crashes are rare. Therefore, I'd rather have. Faster runtime performance than than and then pay the penalty on the on the the occasion I have to recover from from a from a log. Yes. So you're talking of uh, the SQLite, the, the one you mentioned above, or the current implementation? The current implementation is is no force steel because it's right ahead log. The one I showed here is it would be force steel because it would be uh, again even that's not yeah it would be force steel because you flush out the dirty pages to say the transactions commit uh, and you're allowed to flush out dirty pages uh, even before they commit. But you always have to make a copy of it. It's like a reverse of shadow page. You always make a copy on the journal, on the, on the, on the original version on the side file. All right, I think I mentioned before there was, there was this, this old database system from Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico in the 1970s, where they would always have power, power failures. And so they chose to go with a system that was uh, slower runtime performance in exchange for faster recovery time because they were crashing randomly throughout the day. They didn't know how long they were gonna have until the next power outage. So they they were willing to pay the penalty at runtime to have instant recovery because when the power came back on they didn't know how long they had until, before the power went out again. That's the only system I know that that well that that's one example where you want to have really fast recovery time. All right. So let's talk about what's actually in our log files. Um, so there's basically three things you can put in there. So there's a physical logging would be like Think of like you know get diff like it's literally a, a, the delta between the at a byte level of the old version of the page and the new version of the page. Um, the logical logging is when you would actually store just like the operation that the that the the transaction made or the query made, uh, like like literally the, the SQL command. And then the physical lo physiological logging is what most systems implement, where it's sort of a combination of the two of them. You're still going to store a, a diff of the of of the the contents of the for the previous version and the old version, but you'll do it at, like at you would do it at a tuple level. So in the physical log, it'd be at the page level, and it, the when you do the diff, the the to avoid you know conflicts you would have in, like in, in 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 version control system like Git, you'd have to have the the right version when you apply the diff uh, of the page so that the the, the the diff applies cleanly, but if you do it with physiological logging, you say, here's the, tuple I, here's the diff of the tuple. I don't actually know where in the page is actually being stored, but I'll just give you a slot number. And then you can adjust where things are in the slot array and let the, and, and let the data system figure out where should the, the diff actually be applied. Um, and the reason why you want to do this one as well, because if I run things like the vacuum, where I'm start cleaning up old versions, the, between the time I go apply the, the, the change on recovery, versus the time when I actually made the diff in the first place, the page layout may have changed. So physical logging would have a lot of conflicts, right? So let's just use a simple example here. Say I have a, qu a query like this. I'm updating a single, updating uh, a table. Physical logging would have like the diff be exactly at an offset and before and after values. For indexes, you'd have the same thing. You'd have to say, here's the actual page and here's the diff of the pages I, I want to modify. With logical logging, you literally, literally just store the, the query in there. Right, and that's enough at runtime or sorry at recovery time 
say, okay, well, here's the change I need. Here's the, here's the change that was applied to the database. I don't know what pages they modified, but if I just rerun the query, then I'll put you back in the correct state. And the physiological logging, although it looks very similar to the physical logging, basically, again, I'm having a slot number for my diff instead of actually an offset, a byte offset in the page. And then for the index, I can just say, hey, you know, here's, here's the page again. Here's the key, the record, the key value pair I want you to put in this page. I'm not specifying exactly where it is. Yes? So his question is, and his question is, you can't use logical logging for write-ahead logging because you don't know the old value. Because in my example, I showed like the old value and the new value. The that was supposed to be like a high-level demonstration of what basically what physical physiological logging would do. You could replace the old value, new value with 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 this. You would do this primarily for um, you would use this for in-memory systems because then like you. You just figure out, okay, what, what, yeah, this, this, maybe this is hard to understand. Um, you would know at what, what, what is the state of the database on disk and what queries did not get executed, uh, get applied to the things that are on disk. So I have to go re re rerun them. You can ignore the in memory part. Like, I have my state, of, have my version of the database on disk. I look at my log record, my, 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 my logs, and say, okay, what, what version did these, did these queries run in my log records? find the version, the, the first log record that did not make it out to disk, and just rerun all the queries inside them. All right, so the advantage of this is that if, if this query updates a billion tuples, it's one log record to update a billion tuples, whereas this, these two approaches, the physio physiological, physiological and the physical, would have to have one billion entries, right? Whereas this is you know, just one entry. So the log would be a lot smaller, but there's no magic, there's no magic we can do at runtime or recovery time to make the recovery query run faster than the real query. So this query took one hour to run on recovery. It would take a potentially a one hour to run as well. So most, most systems don't do this. Yes? The logical logging schema doesn't really support undo. Right? This question is, it doesn't support undo. Correct. You, you wouldn't need it. You wouldn't? You, you, would not, you would not need it. You will not need to. You can't, you can't you, sorry. You can't have. This is. This is what I'm saying. There's the notion of like if you know the version of the of the, of the version that's on disk, not of individual tuples of like just the database itself. Think of that as a snapshot. If I know what version that is, and what was the last query that I got applied to the to the to the database, then I could rerun. I could figure out what what's the oldest log entry that I haven't applied, and then re, re execute all the queries that come after that. You okay. can Yeah, so, so his question, same as you would not be able to use logical logging to undo the, the previous version. Correct, yes. Because I can put like update set value equals random, like, you know, literally a random number, and I wouldn't know what the old version was. Yes. There's only, like, this, this approach is used in a very, very small number of systems, but you could do it. All right, so in the sake of time, let me skip this. It's just basically, I'm just, main takeaway is everyone does physiological logging. Physical logging has too much depend dependence on the, the, having the exact page layout. Physiological logging gives you the freedom to potentially move tuples around and apply the diff, uh, uh, you know, for just just, where, just on the tuple, not the entire page. And then nobody, like I said, very very few systems do logical logging. The thing I want to bring up that uh, he he mentioned before is that, okay, what about these log structure systems? Isn't this write ahead log redundant? The answer is yes. Log structure database systems don't have dirty pages because there's only the log records. You buffer them into memory, and then once that buffer, called the mem table, once that's full, then you flush that out. But that mem table could be quite large; could be like 10 megabytes. And so I need to have the write-ahead log as a separate log file to say, here's the changes that I've made uh, to the database for transactions that I've said that I've committed, but I haven't flushed the mem table out yet. So if there's now a crash, I come back, look at my write-ahead log, and use that to recreate the in-memory mem table. Right? Seems redundant. This this is what everyone does. Okay. So to quickly to to as a preview of what we're gonna talk about next week, an obvious problem with the write-ahead log, just like in, in the delta the, the version chains for uh, MVCC, is that these things can grow forever. Right? If I keep committing transactions, I keep appending log records. If I crash now, I potentially have to replay the entire log to put me back in a correct state. 
right? So my, if, my, if I, my database runs for a year, then it crashes, I, I would have to replay the entire log, or look at the, examine the entire log for the entire year to try to figure out did all my changes actually make it out. So to avoid this problem, is, uh, one way to avoid this problem, or the way to avoid this problem is, is do what's called checkpoints. And this is where we're going to, at some point in time, we're going to flush all the dirty pages that are in our buffer pool out to disk. It's OK that the transactions may have not committed. That's OK. But then we're going to put a, uh, introduce a new kind of log record that says, here, we took a checkpoint. So at this point, we'd know that anything that was modified prior to this checkpoint that was in memory has been written to disk. And that sort of caps how far back in time we have to go look in our log. right? Essentially, a hint of telling us where we, where we need to look after our crash. So I'm going to show you sort of a naive checkpoint scheme uh, to give you the basic idea. And then we'll see what the problems are. And the next class will be, how do we actually do this for real? So the way this is going to work is that when, when the data system is going to decide, I want to run a checkpoint, it's going to pause all queries. Right? Whether or not you wait till, the, till they finish or not, it doesn't matter for, for this, our purpose right here. Then we're going to flush all the log records that are in memory out to disk. Then we're going to flush all the dirty pages that are in memory out to disk. Because again, the, the log records have to get written first. Then we're going to add a checkpoint entry to our write-ahead log and then resume any queries that we paused. Right, so say we have a setup like this. We had three transactions running, T1, T2, T3. But then at the end, there's a crash. Right. So we took a checkpoint right here. So upon recovery, we would have somewhere, somewhere in, the, in the system on disk would say, here's, the, here's the, the offset in the log file of where you took the took checkpoint. Jump there, and that'll tell you, what, you know, at least be a starting point where you look around and see what's going on. So at this point here, we would, we would go back and say, all right, well, I sort of reverse go in reverse order up in the log and figure out what transactions were running at the time I crashed. So I'd find T3, T2, and then T1. Right? In the case of T1, it committed before the checkpoint. So I know that all its changes were written out the disk, at least the log records have written out the disk. And at the checkpoint, I flushed everything, to uh, any dirty pages as well. So any page that was modified by T1, at this point, at the checkpoint, had been written to disk. So we, don't, we, we can ignore anything that T1 does. But for T2 and T3, they started before the checkpoint, and then they didn't commit. Uh, they started and did not commit before the checkpoint. So we need to go make sure that their changes get applied. In the case of T2, after the checkpoint, we see a commit record. We know that got written to disk because it's in our log when we come back. So at this point, we see the T2 committed. We, tell, we told the outside world it committed. So we need to make sure we redo all its changes and, and make sure they get applied. But we don't see a commit record for T3, so this transaction was aborted. So now we need to go use this log record to reverse any changes and make sure that any page that it modified, uh, those changes aren't applied. Yes? Why do we need to redo T2 when the checkpoint gets flushed out? Uh, right, so the question is, yeah, so the statement is, I, I do a checkpoint, then T2 commits. In between this, there wasn't any update, so therefore T2's changes have already been flushed to disk. Assume there's another update here. Then you have to check, yes. To your, to, to your point, yes. Again, PowerPoint limitations. OK. So this approach, again, it'll work, but it has an obvious problem that we have to stall all queries and transactions while we take a checkpoint to make sure that's consistent. Right? And if, my check, if I have a huge buffer pool, like you know, one terabyte of memory, which is not unheard of these days, and I have one terabyte of, of dirty pages, I've got to write out, you know, I pause all the, all the queries, then write out one terabyte of data to disk, then I, then I can unpause the, uh, the queries, right? And that's, I, that's, you know, that your system will look unresponsive. That's not, a, that's not an option in a, in a modern system. So we'll see how to get around that problem next class. The other challenge is going to be how we're going to scan and find what are the transactions that, that are actually were uncommitted at the moment of the checkpoint, right? I'm, again, I was using, I was being hand wavy here, but basically, I'm gonna have to read log entries, parse them, figure out what's going on, to, up to some point until I don't see any more transactions uh, that could have been running, right? So, obviously, that would be expensive to do if you have a really, uh, if you have a lot of transactions running, at, you know, every time you take a checkpoint. So we can just store some hints in our checkpoint records in the log to say, here's the transactions that are running at the time of, of the checkpoint. So we can use that again to short circuit how much how much work we have to do. The other challenge is going to be how, how often we should take a check, checkpoints, which is not really defined by this. Um, so if we take checkpoints all the time, like nonstop, then right, it's, it's, we're going to have really great recovery times because we're not going to look at much of the log. But of course, now the checkpoints aren't free. 
uh, and especially in a blocking case, we're blocking queries. So now your checkpoint is just going to be stalling the system uh, indefinitely. But you don't want to be at the other end of the spectrum, like take a, che take a checkpoint every once a month, because now, again, you have to replay the log for once a month. So we'll see how to um, we'll see how to avoid the blocking case, but the how often you should take a checkpoint is going to depend on the application's recovery requirements. So in some cases, I you know for highly available systems, you know you do, you want zero downtime, so you want to, you're very aggressive on checkpoints, and you're willing to pay that penalty at runtime because you want to be able to come back real quickly after a crash. In in a lot of systems, you know if it's five minutes, yeah, who cares, right? Ten minutes that might be good enough. Again, it depends on the application. This is not something the data system can figure out for you. All right, so any questions about write-ahead log and checkpoints? Again, we'll cover checkpoints more next class. Uh, but again, the main thing to point out is write-ahead logging is pretty much how everyone's going to do this. It's going to do incremental updates to pages using steal no force. And then on recovery, we're going to undo any uncommitted transactions and re redo the committed transactions. And we have enough information in the log to help us to do this. OK? All right, guys. See you next class. Hit it. Done and get it over with Cause the whole world's waiting for another Tears town street sound Clown a motherfucker if you label me a fake I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snake